Uh, welcome, everyone. It's really good to see those of you whose faces I can see and good of you to all be here, even if we can't see your faces. I hope you're all snug and safe at home in the midst of this slow moving snowstorm. Um, my name is Ellen Schwartz. I am the coordinator of the Bergen County chapter of CHAD. Um, and our, cha our chapter is so lucky. We have a wonderful, great support team. We've been holding these speaker series since um, on Zoom since May because of the pandemic. And we're just delighted at the positive reception that we've gotten. Uh, in addition, just so you know, in addition to tonight's speaker series, you can see that we have other speakers coming up. Uh, next month is Leslie Josel, who's going to talk about procrastination and experts guide to getting stuff done and either take a screenshot of this or you can check it out on our website. Um, and that is chadchadd.net slash chapter slash 545. Uh, Joni, you want to scroll up a little? We also have three support groups now. Um, uh, Isabel Ibrahami runs a support group the third Monday of every month, and that's for adults. And we now have two parent support groups that are run by um, Joni Korn and with the support of Andrea Elram. The uh, second Wednesday of each month, from 8 to 9.15 is for parents of pre-K through sixth grade and the fourth Wednesday of each month, same timing, is for parents of teens seventh grade and up. Um, you can find us uh, at www.chad.net slash chapter slash 545. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me at adhd.bergencounty at gmail.com and Brand new this week, you can visit us on Facebook at Bergen County Chad. Uh, so I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, you're, please remain on mute. We will um, not want that distraction. And um, if you have any thoughts or questions for um, Dr. Burton, please put it in the chat and um, he will look at it at the end if the questions haven't been answered um, or if you don't want to forget. And uh, we'll leave plenty of time at the end for um, Q&A. Uh, so just briefly, um, I, I know Mark from two different arenas. Um, he, he is a developmental pediatrician, speaker, and author of... Can I make a request? Somebody's rustling a lot of papers around. Could they not do that while we are trying sure. to listen to Helen? Sure, it's me doing it, so I apologize. Um, so he's a speaker and author, How Children Thrive and Mindful Parenting for ADHD, which integrates mindfulness into evidence-based pediatric care. He's also a contributing author for teaching mindfulness skills to kids and teens. Um, he's on the faculty of New York Medical College and the Windward Teacher Training Institute. So with no more further ado, um, I'd, I'm excited to introduce Mark. And um, there you are. Great. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. Um, I am certainly uh, looking forward to tonight's talk and uh, glad everyone's here. Hope we can come up with uh, and cover some material that everyone's interested in. Certainly one of my favorite talks to give um, because in many ways it covers really the full spectrum of everything that ADHD um, is. And it really is, a, um, I think, an important topic, not so much in a way of looking at complementary medicine in its kind of traditional sense, but looking more at what comprehensive ADHD care needs to look like in general. So what I want to cover today is, um, oops, one slide too many there, sorry about that. What I, what I want to cover today, and I'm going to start my slideshow. Hold on, pardon me for the tech issue, the Zoom, the Zoom instructions were in front of the 
slideshow. There we go. So what I want to cover today then is initially just looking at like why ADHD is more than people may think it is and how that helps us define what all these different interventions are that might support evidence-based care focus then on what I really consider um, foundations of ADHD care. I think this is a useful model for anyone to come back to periodically if you're not sure you're doing everything you can when things need adjusting as kids get older. Uh, you can look at these um, sort of baskets of interventions, parenting and behavioral interventions, educational interventions, complementary and health interventions. Um, and I'll touch on, even though it's obviously not the topic for today, briefly, um, medical interventions and how to understand them. So when we start looking at how we best need to understand ADHD, there's sort of an old school view of it, and it's not incorrect, it's just limited, that is based on our traditional definition. And this is not the full definition of ADHD here. It's a selection of symptoms having to do with inattention. There's actually nine listed in the traditional diagnosis, a selection having to do with hyperactivity and impulsivity. Again, there's nine listed in the actual diagnosis. Um, you might even hear it in my voice already. I find this like particular view of it kind of limiting, not very exciting to talk about either because it doesn't really capture ADHD fully. And I think the really important points as we look at what we're trying to intervene for when it comes to ADHD, um, start with this concept, which is that really the point of ADHD, sometimes there's like a misunderstanding of like, what's the difference between ADHD and typical childhood or letting kids be kids. And I think the simplest one line answer to that is that there's a wide range of typical development. We should let kids be kids, but no one should be living with a chronic significant impairment of their life in some way. And that's really the bottom line when it comes to ADHD. Part of the diagnosis is saying these symptoms are persistent and persistent to the point that they're impairing life in an ongoing way. And that's really why we so need to step in and intervene. I actually um, can talk the rest of the night just about the idea of seeing ADHD as an executive function disorder. So executive function is a skill set that has to do with all of life management. Uh, one of the newer aspects we understand about child development now is that it actually really does represent a developmental path. These are skills that are supposed to begin in early childhood. They actually mature until we're almost 25 years old which is why ADHD in many ways is a developmental diagnosis. What we're looking for is compared to other children the same age, are your skills roughly where they need to be? And again, if they don't seem to be, are they far enough behind that you're causing yourself some significant impairment? And this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of understanding ADHD, parenting ADHD, teaching kids with ADHD. It's recognizing that it's not even about a short attention span, so when kids have attention management issues, they hyper-focus, they can't shift attention, they can't focus when the vans go up, they have to manage their behavior and that's the action management part. And then task management has to do with organizing, planning, prioritizing, time management. And this is so much the heart of online learning and why ADHD is such a struggle with distance learning. Information management is organizing and using information on the fly. It's like the processing part of the brain in essence. So that if you have significant issues with information management, even as you're listening to me speak tonight, that's the part of your brain that's responsible for catching the important part and sort of integrating into what you already know. And if we have a back and forth conversation, getting it back to me in an organized way. Uh, emotional management is a um, huge issue in ADHD. I believe Ellen mentioned that I spoke uh, for her, her sister's group recently, and that's what the topic we covered was just emotional management because emotional, dysregulated emotions are a huge part of ADHD too. And then there's sustained effort. And that really, you know, if you can take nothing else from today's talk, can be profoundly life-changing when parents or teachers or adults working with ADHD really understand that ADHD isn't particularly a school problem, uh, that in essence, it's a proven medical disorder. There's not really any debate about that anymore. And the simple, uh, the single most practical way to understand it is that a child is behind in self-management skills. Executive function really relates to almost any word, anything you can think of in life that has that you can put the word management to probably has to do with executive function. You have to manage your attention, you have to manage projects, you have to manage uh, time, you have to manage your emotion. So all those things relate to executive function. And executive function is also the foundation of learning. So for example, there's a new model of reading that looks at how reading involves 
the skill of decoding. It involves an aspect that has to do with language and content knowledge. And then the third piece of reading that helps you become a fluent, effective reader is executive function. It's the ability to process the information and stay focused and, and actually you know, integrate everything you already know. So executive function can impact any aspect of learning as well. In spite of that, there was one point I wanted to make today before moving on to treatment, which is in spite of all the brain information we have about ADHD at this point, we still can't test for it specifically. It's a clinical diagnosis. I mean, it actually uh, fits exactly in line with my field and my training, because really what we're saying nowadays is it's a developmental diagnosis. We're stating that we're looking at all the information we can gather from different sources, from meeting a child ourselves and pulling it all together and trying to see, can we show that there's an ongoing pattern of some impact of executive function that causes challenges in day-to-day -day life? So it's all about real life functioning Certainly in the, in, you know, in the part of the world we live in, there's, there's a uh, sort of subtle suggestion sometimes that, neuro, uh, that neuropsychological testing is required for ADHD because of this link to executive function. And even that's been shown to miss the diagnosis of ADHD because pen and paper testing doesn't really catch ADHD. The way I've been thinking about that recently is that neuropsychological testing to me is a little like looking at a forest and testing the trees right in front of you. You know, and if you happen to catch something, it might indicate something about the rest of the forest, but it's really the forest you're trying to evaluate. And the forest is, how are you doing in real life? So the diagnosis is clinical medicine. It's really saying, can we collect enough information to figure out what we need to know? So when we come to treatment of ADHD, which is why you're all here today, as I mentioned in the lead, I, I prefer to think of it, I think it's a, just a practical model to come back to looking at there's four areas of, of potential intervention that can be effective. They each have evidence behind them in different ways. And really the topic, the title of today's talk, honestly, is a little bit of a bait and switch almost because I'm not saying instead of medication and I'm not saying don't use medication. You know, really the premise of today's talk is that in spite of how they're often talked about, medications have been shown to be wildly effective really safe, really if they're managed meticulously and well, most people do not have to live with any significant side effects, which is not the perception many people have. It has a lot to do with the management. And yet they also, even when they go well, are a step towards all the rest of the things I'm gonna to cover today. Because medications are very specifically good for things like focus and impulse control. They don't necessarily manage all of executive function. The other reason today's topic is particularly important is because not everybody responds to the medication. Even having a success rate conservatively of 80% means that one in five people don't tolerate the medications well. And then obviously for very many different reasons, the medications aren't always wanted. They don't necessarily cover the day. So if we're really gonna treat ADHD thoroughly, you know, we have to look at everything I just led with, which is to say that it's not a school problem. It's a disorder that affects all of life in different ways and for differently for different people. And that there's no single intervention that's necessarily gonna manage it. To me, it's always like fitting the pieces of a puzzle together until we feel like we have everything covered. So for the rest of today's talk, I wanna cover the non-medical side of ADHD as best as I'm able. And that starts with evidence-based behavioral interventions. One way I often summarize it for people is that the two most proven interventions for ADHD are probably behavioral interventions and medication, just statistically. So if you, you, know, if you just diagnose someone with ADHD, if your child, if you find out has ADHD, you typically want to be doing at least one or the other to start. You know, I mean, whatever you think about the medical side of things, you don't want to be doing neither because those are the two most proven things. There's educational planning to touch on. And then, you know, there's different terms that get used, be either holistic health or complementary care we can talk about also. So I'll start by talking about the parent side of ADHD. And really one of the most important things to recognize about that, um, and I'm not gonna focus only on children today, but I'm gonna largely focus on children today, is realizing that if you're gonna support a child with ADHD, you really have to recognize that ADHD impacts whole families. And I think that's often overlooked because Research shows, and any of you who are parents don't need me to tell you this, but research shows that parenting a child with ADHD increases stress for both parents and kids. It might affect self-esteem, not just for children, but when you look at parents confident in their own parenting, it creates challenges with relationships. And all of that 
begins to affect not only how you feel, which is no small thing. I always feel like if I'm working with ADHD, you know, I'm working with families, not individuals. But if you think about what goes into making uh, new decisions or making hard decisions or sticking to a you know, new behavioral plan or staying calm when you know, it seems like your house is falling apart, you know, all of that is exacerbated by chronic stress if we're not managing that stress in some way. And I'm gonna come back around to that because if we can take care of ourselves, that in essence helps us implement the rest of evidence-based ADHD care. It helps us see things with more clarity and act with more clarity. So taking care of ourselves is a major step towards just doing all these you know, different, there's so many things we're gonna to cover today and they're all, you know, take some sort of effort and planning. So what does research say about managing ADHD? Well, you know, many different studies going back to one you might have all heard about. It's been, I mean, depending on which talks you've been to called the MTA study, um, have looked at what are the interventions that can support people with ADHD. So the MTA study is one of the more famous ones. Um, and in that study, basically they randomized people into a medication only group, a behavioral therapy only group, a combined group. And then there was an interesting other arm, which was just sending people back to their community doctor with a diagnosis of ADHD. <clears throat> and what that study showed was many, many different things, but it was um, not what actually they anticipated. You know, my understanding is they were anticipating what they were looking to prove is that everybody would benefit from both medication and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And what they ended up showing is that the medications were way more, several times more effective for the focus and impulsivity part of ADHD. That cognitive behavioral therapy was really good for things like anxiety, self-esteem, satisfaction, parents feeling better, other conditions that occur with ADHD, you know, lots of roles for cognitive behavioral therapy, but that compared to the medication alone, it didn't really touch the core symptoms all that much. Um, but that long-term other studies have shown it also may improve independence. So behavioral therapy, going back to that very, uh, you know, very important study in my field has been shown to have plenty of benefits, but not necessarily to be able to replace medication. So in many parts of the world, cognitive behavioral therapy still is considered the initial intervention more so than the United States recommendations. And it's often what I think is a better approach for getting started with care. We don't all have to leap right to medication, but it is important to understand the research also. You know, those countries don't agree, disagree with the research. They just sort of have a, a different uh, way of looking at it in essence. Um, I guess I'll touch on it because I brought it up. I feel like I'm talking about medication more than I wanted to today. So I'll say one last thing and move on. The interesting thing about the uh, arm of that study where they just referred people back to their uh, general pediatricians is those kids were also started on medication, but they didn't do as well as the kids who were started on medication in the study. And that's because in the study, they did almost weekly changes based on side effects and benefits until people were maximized maximize their benefits with no side effects. And I think that may be the most important lesson of that whole study overall, is that to get the medications right requires a ton of micromanagement until you're there. But like I said, I don't want to uh, focus too much on the medication today. So let me look at a little bit of what we know about uh, behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy, which I touched on is a type of therapy that's very skills-based, you know, and really the focus of it in its purest form is working with an individual on developing skills to help them manage whatever is uh, impacting their life or emotion or behavior in some way. So it's not psychotherapy. Um, it's very structured and really meant to provide practical skills to help you manage your life differently and probably does have an impact on ADHD. But when we look at behavioral therapy a little broader and begin to look at what it is to uh, work with young children, ADHD has a unique impact, which is that since ADHD is the part of the brain responsible for, for planning, persistence, problem solving, you know, all these skills you would use in essence to manage your own ADHD, you can almost look at it as saying that kids with ADHD are behind in the skills that would allow them to manage their own ADHD. They're behind in the skills that will actually help them pick up the skills that go on in therapy and generalize them into life if they're not getting a lot of adult support. And there's a little bit of research even suggesting that in younger kids, parent training alone may be as effective as an initial intervention than even involving the children. 
And this is an important statement, particularly in the era of COVID, because adults have a much easier time doing therapy online than young children do. But you can get a lot out of that. And it's really not a comment on anyone's parenting, although the concept of parent, parent training can feel judgmental. It isn't meant to be. It's simply recognizing that at this age in life, pretty much all of learning is just about immediate feedback. And it's really a vital point. One of the ways that I often describe it in my practice is that discussion has a role in early childhood and, and these sort of behavioral interventions have a role in early childhood, but discussion very rarely changes short-term behavior. The analogy I often use is that discussion, um, and I always wanna be nuanced in saying this, if it doesn't matter whether you believe in religious, uh, you know, like religious school, but if you potentially do, if you think of religious school, you know, the reason we send someone there, most of us wouldn't be because we expect on any given Sunday for their behavior to change. The reason you make the choice to do that is because you're hoping that over many years, they're gonna integrate some type of thinking that you believe in, that you think is important. You can almost look at discussion and parenting the same way. It's really important for forming relationships. It's really important for uh, explaining yourself for sort of imparting what you think is important, but it's the long-term plan. It's not the short-term plan. The short-term plan is basically acknowledging how kids are wired really all the way through, you know, at least elementary school, probably middle school for many of them, which is to say that some behavior happens and the next immediate thing that happens either reinforces more of it or discourages it. And even the most brilliant child, just because of typical brain development, that's primarily how they're learning when they're young. So if you wanna teach a child to study more, manage their emotions differently, you know, pretty much anything, the most powerful tool you may have at hand is sort of that adults driven tool. And if you can coordinate between parents and teachers even better so that they're just getting this um, model that typically what you're looking to do is lead with praise and reward you know, that sounds simpler than it is, but the point is, is that kids with ADHD just get corrected all the time. It's part of having, it's part of having ADHD. It doesn't mean anyone's doing anything right or wrong. It just means that, um, you know, if you have a child with poor self-management skills, they're gonna require that type of correction frequently. And that changes how they feel about themselves. It can impact relationships. So you want more than you might if you didn't have a child with ADHD to have a really structured approach to um, what's often called the ABC model of behavior intervention. The A stands for you have to anticipate situations. It looks for what triggers different behaviors and trying to work with sort of how you make requests, for example, or anticipating transitions, all the things you might do in, in trying to address a problematic behavior ahead of time. The C stands for consequences, kind of in its purest sense of the word, not in terms of punishment, but just outcome. You know, the behavior happens and then are we gonna do things that sort of praise and reward and encourage more of it? Or are we gonna do things that discourage it in different ways? And that is the heart and soul of parenting ADHD in early childhood that, that that's more complex than it sounds. You know, clearly there's whole programs built just around that model, um, but it always starts with us so that, you know, adults can create routines that help support executive function. We can anticipate skills kids need to develop and because we are the ones in theory with the, you know, sort of adult executive function, the adult perspective in the room, you know, we can be the ones who sort of lay out what's the most important next step to be taking. And that is uh, really the core of most behavioral interventions and really is something, a model you can fall back on. You might think about all the way through high school because all the way up through high school, you know, you can anticipate the fact that kids aren't necessarily going to, um, think you know, long-term quite like we want them to, especially if they have ADHD. As I mentioned before, typical teen development is 10 years away from having mature judgment and planning. So even a teenager with ADHD might need us to help them structure their time or set a screen bedtime so they can go to bed at the right time, or maybe a reward plan so they learn how to, the benefits of studying through the motivation we create externally. So the first foundation of non-medical intervention for ADHD is always just coming back to those parenting and behavioral interventions. And I guess one thing I would say before I transition, because it does come up sometimes, is that behavioral interventions for ADHD aren't just for problem behaviors. It's not just for kids who are misbehaving. It's a way of teaching skills and keeping things positive just in general as we're trying to meet kids where they are developmentally 
and move them towards the skills and steps we want them to take. So the second foundation of intervention has to do with educational interventions. So I already showed one version of this statement, which is just recognizing that executive function is the skill set you use to manage a classroom. So executive function and skills like focus, forgetfulness, or ADHD symptoms, I should say, like forgetfulness, organizing yourself to take notes, writing, uh, you know, just goes on note taking, they're all executive function based skills. So ADHD profoundly affects education across the board. One way to look at educational uh, accommodations in general is that for the most part, they're meant to be accommodations and they don't unfortunately often act as the core ADHD intervention. The goal for the most part is to keep kids learning up to their full capacity while other interventions help them catch up around their ADHD. And I'm giving this talk, you know, I, I think in the Q&A, we can come back to things that might help during distance learning, but I'm gonna go over the basics of it first. So what does it mean to uh, intervene for ADHD in a school setting? There's three or four different ideas that I think are really important. The first is, is that we have to encourage schools, schools to look past that old school definition of ADHD because you know, one of the summaries I think that is most profound that we can always come back to is, you know, as a metaphor for all the complexities of executive function is that forgetfulness is an ADHD symptom. So if you have a child, and this is coming up chronically with distance learning, who is consistently forgetful, marking them down over and over again without helping them do something about it is just punishing them for having ADHD. You know, forgetfulness is an ADHD symptom. And if they could just learn from their mistakes, if it was that easy, you know, clearly they wouldn't choose to be forgetful then, but it's way more complicated than that. You know, procrastination is an ADHD symptom. You can't teach someone not to procrastinate just by saying, stop procrastinating, stop handing things in late. And this is a major problem I find quite often, you know, I will say just to, um, maybe soften what I'm going to be saying a little bit is just recognizing that you know, I do come from a family of teachers, so nothing I say means to be disrespectful of teachers, but I would say that my experience is that the educational environment we're in right now, especially in sort of the New York metro area, is really, really demanding of kids, you know, so it's pushing them to do more than typically, you know, like a generation ago, we would have expected them to do at any given age. And what does it mean to manage more than you're typically being asked to do? It means we're pushing your executive function harder. We're asking you to manage and coordinate a lot of stuff. And if you have ADHD, you're behind in that skill set. So now you may be totally brilliant and behind an executive function, and therefore the gap grows larger. There's also a perception quite often of some of something called self-advocacy being, you know, vital to have right now when self-advocacy itself is a developmental skill set, It's a wonderful goal. Everyone should learn to self-advocate. And yet kids with ADHD in particular are often behind in that skill. And it's not fair to sort of sit back and wait for them to come for extra help when you clearly can see they have a need for it. And knowing ADHD, you know they have a planning disorder. You know, that's a really important way to see ADHD. And it may just be way more important in the short run to just get them in don't wait, just say you're going to come in or just email their parents and say, you know, they've missed a couple of things because they're probably struggling, struggling with planning. So the second thing, so that's one thing about intervening for ADHD in schools is really broaden the plan. You know, if you look at Chad or Attitude Magazine or any of the people who have put out these extensive lists of possible 504 interventions. So the 504 law is the accommodations law that typically covers ADHD. There are hundreds of things on those lists because really the law says nothing about grades. It says that we can't allow ADHD to impact your learning. You can be an A student and if it's taking you 10 times the effort to do it, you, know, you still require accommodations. The second thing to understand about educational planning is that at least 50% and maybe closer to 60% of kids with ADHD have learning disabilities. And that means that we can't assume that someone who's struggling has ADHD alone we often have to have a very low threshold for testing for those other learning disabilities. And then really the way I typically summarize the, um, you know, the overall uh, intervention, I think this works both at home as a model and at school, 
is that in the short term, we just need a safety net. Kids with ADHD are struggling with self-management skills, maybe in multiple aspects of life. You know, they may be forgetful, they don't know how to manage time, whatever it is, they've just got this broad problem going on. And in the short run, those skills can't change. You know, I mean, really short run. Like this week, I can't change what those skills are. You know, this week, we just have to help them overcome it, help them keep moving forward, help them feel good about themselves by just building the safety net of adult created supports at home, which is an exhausting concept. It's part of why this is so stressful for parents. I mean, I, I never want to, you know, fail to acknowledge that. This is incredibly demanding on adults. And the same thing goes at school. You know, the school is required, in theory, to create that safety net because you're not really accomplishing anything just by marking someone's grades down over again if you don't tie it to a solution. And then long-term, we certainly have to build the skills to create independence. Um, and really the core concept there is that kids typically do want to be independent. They don't even always look like it, but they do. So in building that safety net, we don't really, in my experience, have to worry much that someone's going to come to rely on it. It doesn't typically become a crutch as long as we're looking for that opportunity to step out of the way. And the analogy I often use there is it's a lot like that moment when we're teaching someone to ride a bike. You know, you have your hand on the back of the seat and you're holding them up and you're holding them up and you're holding them up, but you're waiting for that moment to let go. And that's what these plans are like. Kids don't want you holding onto the back of the bike. They're gonna let you know if they think they got it and then you give them a chance. So then if they don't, you step in again a little bit, you grab the bike again. But the most important thing, particularly during COVID, is just recognizing that this is really hard and they're behind in the skills they need to take advantage, to take control of it. They're behind in their planning skills and they're gonna require us as adults to be the ones to set up that structure most often. Now in teens, you might give them, a, it's a different model where you might give them the lead and try to collaborate and let them you know, go as far as they can, um, but you're still gonna put your hand on the bike when you need to. Because you know, even as teens, they may be struggling with planning. They may be struggling with time management, whatever else it is. So you give them more opportunities to lead on their plans or to collaborate on their plans, but with a very clear view of what's kind of the bottom line that has to happen is also. So the last thing, which in my experience is often mostly what got people here that I wanna talk about before opening for questions Are general health and complementary interventions because they're a very important part of ADHD care also. They're important not just because many of them are evidence-based, which I think is you know, you know, something that's very reassuring, um, but also because most people try them. So we have to acknowledge that it's going on and sort of, I think, you know, my view on things is I'm very open to them. You know, I teach meditation for a reason. Um, and at the same time, we need to be clear what the research shows too. I mean, if something's been disproven or something's been proven, we should have some idea about that. I guess just to give you a quick example, and then I'll jump into the details because it comes up so often. For example, if you use a two-way mirror to test if children are rea reactive to sugar, and this has been done more than once, so the, kid, the adults outside the room don't know which kids actually had a sugar drink, you can't tell the difference. And as a parent, I would tell you, I don't really believe that. And all the parents in the room might say they really don't believe that. But I will tell you that if you do a double blind study where you can't tell, sugar does not affect children's behavior. And that's the sort of thing like it's worth knowing about. There's other nutritional things I'll touch on in a moment. So my friend Ari Tuckman, who does uh, a lot of writing in adults ADHD, once asked people, what do you think, you know, now that you're, he identified people who thought their ADHD as adults was well managed and asked them, what do you think helped most in getting your ADHD under control? And what he found was that the number one thing that most of them answered, the number one common most answered was when the medication started working correctly. And then apologies to any therapy or coaches on this, it's just one survey. But what he found very interesting was that the number two thing people felt most helped them manage their ADHD was actually establishing a healthy lifestyle. And why is that so important with ADHD? Well, it turns out that as I mentioned, ADHD creates this issue with anything having to do with managing, managing life, persistence, planning, you know, anything that requires routine. And more and more research is showing that undermanaged ADHD actually can affect your health. 
and I should say at this point in the talk that all these, that, that there's one theme to all of this, which is the research can become really overwhelming around ADHD is that the, the theme is it's undermanaged ADHD because I never want people to like leave here with a sense of terror. So when we look at evidence-based ADHD care, we have to recognize that ADHD affects sleeping, sleeping can affect ADHD, you know, ADHD affects exercise, ADHD affects nutrition and eating. So in one study of adult ADHD, I think the number was that they found that 30% of people in an adult obesity clinic had undiagnosed ADHD. So ADHD has been increasingly linked to overweight and obesity. And on Russell Barkley's latest uh, big tracking study of his, this big cohort he's been following, I think for now close to 20 or 30 years, uh, he linked ADHD actually to uh, adult health and showed that ADHD is actually a bigger risk for poor adult health outcomes than any other single risk, in essence, because untreated or undertreated ADHD puts you at risk for all these other health issues. It puts you at risk for driving accidents and drinking and all the, and, and all the health issues, poor exercise, sedentary lifestyle, nutrition, so that if we're going to manage ADHD thoroughly, it turns out that if we look at health, holistic care, what we often find are places in life where um, there are things we can intervene for that are going to both make you feel better and perhaps improve your ADHD. So ADHD, for example, affects, um, whoop, I have these slides backwards and I thought, so I'll switch, switch gears for a second. So you can start with exercise, for example. So ADHD makes it harder to stick to an exercise routine to, um, you know, to do well in sports. So people often drop out of sports when they're younger because executive function interacts sports just like it does a classroom. And yet there was this wonderful study out of England just a couple of years ago that called exercise the only magic pill. Meaning it's about the only thing we can do in life that short of doing it compulsively is gonna have, so there, I mean, anything can be abused, but short of compulsive exercise is gonna have only benefits. There's no downside, the body needs it. That's one of the, one of the results of the study is that I think we have this very Western view that there are people who exercise and people who don't. And yet all the research suggests from a physical point of view, our body just needs exercise of some kind. Um, and then from an emotional point of view, it improves our well-being. it improves learning, it improves sleep, it improves your mood, um, and it probably improves your ADHD symptoms also, although it hasn't been studied. Uh, there's more research needed there, but most people would tell you um, that it does, and there is a developing body of research suggesting that it does. So you can look at this fourth foundation of managing ADHD, the one that Ari discovered in his survey as saying, we need to help kids, and then if you're an adult with ADHD, we need to come back to recognizing just the basics. And I do find this is an important concept in terms of, you know, what can we do to support resilience through the pandemic? You know, there isn't a magic pill to it, so to speak, not an actual pill, but we can come back to just what are the basics that keep anybody resilient? You know, exercise is certainly one of them. And then the second thing that's really important to look at in terms of holistic care of ADHD is sleep because sleep is often disrupted by ADHD. Poor, AD, uh, poor sleep exacerbates your ADHD symptoms, exacerbates your mood, you know, makes it harder to learn, all of which comes back and makes your ADHD worse and makes your education worse and increases your stress. And you know, kids are not particularly motivated to sleep, you know, so it's getting as much as we'd like them to just recognize the value of getting more sleep, it's not so easy. Um, so one of the core interventions at the beginning for many families is looking at sleep. Research shows that almost all sleep problems short of a true sleep disorder revolve, resolve through some new behavioral habit. There's no um, like, you know, radical new plan that's gonna make, I think that's one of my favorite studies. There was a study at some point around sleep that basically showed that almost any sleep method works as long as you stick to it. Because sleep is probably the only routine the human body has that if you are consistent about it, your biology changes you know, your body gets used to it and then you sleep better, which isn't so easy with ADHD, but it is a worthwhile goal. So then a third aspect of health that overlaps with this idea of complementary care and ADHD is nutrition, which is actually often very disappointing for people. It turns out that there isn't much research linking nutrition to ADHD symptoms in the big picture. Sleep and exercise can be quite effective around nutrition. There's a little bit of research saying fish oil and omega-3s might prove beneficial, you know, not as replacing any other part of care, but perhaps supporting it. And most everything else around diet 
really comes back to specifically saying, if you have a specific medical condition, then the intervention might matter. But for everybody else, it probably doesn't. So if you don't have celiac disease, you probably don't, aren't going to benefit from a gluten-free diet. You know, if you're not actually deficient in iron or zinc or some of the vitamins that have been studied, you're not going to benefit from more of them either. And it's very hard to be deficient in the average American diet. You know, sugar, I already mentioned, just because I think it's something that comes up so often. And then there are some kids who are sensitive to food dyes. There's some research showing now. Um, but again, first of all, those are foods that most of us um, recognize aren't the healthiest foods. And second of all, those studies don't show that those dyes are causing ADHD as much as exacerbating it. So if you just, just observationally see that your child has ADHD symptoms that get worse after they eat all those kind of neon colored foods, you can certainly choose to avoid them. And at the same time, if you go to a party where they're served, you know, you can just recognize it might be a rough afternoon, but it's not going to cause a permanent issue in, in children. There's a fourth aspect of complementary care and health that I think is just vital that again, I'm sure is um, going to trigger some questions in the Q&A today, but the, you know, the short answer, the short research summary is that pretty much anything that ADHD puts you at risk for, excessive screen time has also been shown to put you at risk for, um, except not all screen time is created equal. So no one knows the reality of what's going on right now. It's never been done before, obviously but educational uses of screen time are not what's typically been studied in the studies that have shown that too much screen time exacerbates ADHD and behavior and other things. It's usually you know, video games and, and those sorts of, of, of activities. Screen time also, if we don't set limits on it, in and of itself changes how kids eat, creates poor sleep habits, gets in the way of nutritional choices, cuts into exercise and reading. Um, and again, I think clearly I could have made the entire talk about this today in the middle of the pandemic, but I would say my short answer before I see what comes up in the Q&A around this last piece of overall health is that for, for this generation, I think managing technology for kids or with kids is as important as sleep, exercise, and nutrition. It is a technology designed to be disruptive, to impact attention and behavior. And if we don't help kids manage it in a skillful way, you know, they can just be consumed by it. It undermines so many aspects of their health. One of my favorite studies of technology says simply that strong parental moderation of screen time correlates with better educational, social, and behavioral outcomes all on its own. Kids aren't necessarily going to make the choices they need. And even during the pandemic, we can just seek balance. You know, we, we can just look at it and say the school day is the school day. Can't touch that and kids need social time. We don't wanna cut into that too much. You know, They need to have some social time, but then for the rest of the day, there needs to be balance. They need to be off the screens early enough to go to bed on time. They need to be getting some exercise. They need some screen-free time just for their general mental health. And they're gonna rely on us as adults to make that happen. Okay, a lot of information in a short time for today. I'll spend just two or three minutes on probably my favorite topic and then leave it open for the questions. So one last aspect of complementary care, probably the most proven uh, intervention that takes advantage of neuroplasticity um, is mindfulness. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is also a new idea in brain development. And it's the basic fact that our brain restructures itself based on experience throughout our entire lives. So anything we do habitually, often enough, begins to lay down neurological pathways. And when it comes to interventions that take advantage of that, um, what mindfulness is, in spite of how it's often talked about, is basically an exercise program, in essence. With mindfulness, we practice building certain traits that help managing life become simpler to manage. The core premise of mindfulness is that things are often challenging and will knock us off balance, and our resilience depends on learning how to relate to that well. Not that we're going to be totally still or that our minds are going to be always quiet or that we're going to be always calm or a lot of the cliches that actually tend to keep people from doing the program. You know, people just sort of shut down when they think, oh, I'm never going to do that. Or my, my, I just have a busy mind. I can never stop that. The point of mindfulness is instead that it is challenging to meditate. That's the point. Just like it is challenging to start a gym program if you've never worked out before. And what we can learn to do is 
become less distracted, but never not distracted. We can learn to work with habits of thought that we have and maybe change some of them so that we relate to our challenges differently. And there's a lot more I can say about mindfulness, but I would just say from a research point of view, mindfulness in general, less of the research is specific to ADHD, has been shown to reduce stress clearly, which as I mentioned, just reducing stress all on its own can be a very important support for someone living with ADHD to improve well being. There is some research suggesting that is true with ADHD specifically, that attention and executive function can improve, that really the more, the more core issue I think with ADHD or the more core challenge I should say, is that we're not trying to be calm. There's actually a purpose to it. The, in the big picture, what's happening is the assumption is if we can stay settled more often, we'll see more clearly and we'll be able to start making more active choices and changing the habits that might be getting in the way of our own well-being, which we all have in different ways. So you can look at like the habits of how we manage emotions and recognize that emotions come and go. And we all have our ways we've learned to manage them growing up. And it doesn't mean yelling necessarily. It could be ignoring them. It could be shutting down. It could be whatever it is. But that the habit we have around our emotion is not the same as the emotion itself, even though it often feels that way. This is just, you know, we have this belief that this is how I deal with emotions. This is just me. Um, it turns out that they're two different things. And with practice, for example, we can learn to separate them. We can start to see, oh, this emotion's happening. And what I typically do is go down this path, but this time I'm not going to do that. And that begins to allow for more choices. And one study in the last couple of years showed benefits around managing emotions for children as young as seven years old who have ADHD. So in very small children, there were benefits to managing emotions. And then one almost like tease, because I don't have the time to go into explaining it directly, is that the bigger picture of ADHD doesn't have to do even with self-help. It's not that we are going to feel better specifically. The assumption is, is that when we're at our best more often, it changes how we relate to the world around us. And there's an aspect of, AD, of mindfulness practice that's been linked to compassion, which I think is, uh, you know, has always been a benefit in the world that may have be of particular benefit at this moment of time. With ADHD, that can start with self-compassion, realizing that we tend to have really habitual self-critical habits that can be really undermining of our well-being. I'm terrible, I'll never get this. Mindfulness sounds cool, but not me. I couldn't do that, you know, or boy, I blew it again, or, you know, she's looking at me funny, he's looking at me funny. All of these things are part of our mental world, and yet they're just habits. You know, many of them may just trace all the way back to our childhood. Um, you know, sometimes it's called the inner critic or people sometimes tie a name to it. Like the, Sharon Salzberg, who's a famous teacher of mindfulness, says so she just calls her inner critic Lucy, you know, like from Peanuts, you know, thanks anyway, got it, you know, but I, I don't need that right now. And we can learn to relate differently to our own inner critic and also even how we relate to the difficult people in our lives. And, and that in the end can develop compassion too, which has been studied to the point where they've shown growth in physical parts of the brain related to the practice of compassion, excuse me, not the practice, the experience of compassion. So in several studies, they've looked at um, functional imaging and shown growth in parts of the brain responsible for compassion. So um, I'm just giving an overview of lots of topics today. I'm certainly happy to come back to that in the Q&A, but the point, the point, the most important detail perhaps is that because mindfulness doesn't require stillness and it doesn't require a totally quiet mind, it is something that is accessible even if you have ADHD and may help you set the foundation that lets you feel more resilient and lets you do some of these other things that then help you more comprehensively manage your ADHD. So that was a big overview of a lot of material. Each of those topics probably could have been their own topic. So I appreciate everyone um, being here and listening. Um, I would say I'll just just to um, put out there if anyone's interested in that mindfulness part, I actually just started a class on the Insight Meditation Timer uh, just this week. That's it's just a prepackaged class, so you can just uh, listen to it at your own pace for getting started with mindfulness. Um, but I'm curious where other questions come up, so I'm going to stop there, and um, I think I'll stop sharing my slides so I can see the chat better. So thank you all for listening, and I'm curious what questions people have. 
So let me go back over here. A couple of them are really long. I would say before I even look at the questions, I can't answer obviously um, individual questions really directly, but I'll try to come up with a you know sort of more general answer related to a topic. Um, the first question I see is just how is CB how is cognitive behavioral therapy implemented with the youngest age group? Um, so ADHD can, I didn't say this specifically, be diagnosed really all the way down to preschool if you look at it developmentally. That's relatively unusual, obviously, because you're not supposed to have a lot of executive function when you're in preschool. But you can be so far behind that you're struggling to make friends or you're, or you're a danger to yourself, and it can be diagnosed really young. And, um, and in the end, um, the answer is if you already answered your own question, which is the younger kids get, the more the intervention relies on parents and teachers. Because really, you're, you know, the simplest way to think of it is, you know, you have the adult perspective that allows you to stick to a plan for, you know, an entire week between sessions and the kids don't yet. So, you know, very important to sort of focus on the fact that it is not a judgment on anyone's parenting. It's just giving parents the skills that help them steer their children's behavior. And that's not exclusively true. Obviously, many of you have come across like see it, special education teachers who work in classrooms with kids. There is a utility for working with kids directly, um, but the initial intervention often does focus largely on parents. Um, and then the second, uh, there's a second and third question. So I guess they're all coming directly to me. So I'll just work straight through them. So the second question is how do you, you know, what would you recommend for someone struggling socially as a result of their ADHD? And, um, and it, it actually, it links to self-esteem, but I'm gonna answer it in two parts. Um, really when it comes to something like um, social skills or how someone who's struggling socially, I'd almost approach it with that same model that I just put out because I think um, in the end, it's a way of creating a checklist and really just saying like, well, what can I do for someone who's struggling socially? So, you know, first you look at it from the point of view of executive function and see like, well, what aspects of ADHD or executive function might be impacting him socially? Is he, you know, so distracted, he's not seeing social cues or so impulsive, he's, you know, breaking social, social mores. Is he, you know, you can just go through it that way and just, you know, ADHD has been linked to, to language issues. You know, is he just having a hard time keeping up in conversation? He or she, pardon my, he, she, they, you know, pardon my gender. Uh, it, I heard that come up in the discussion earlier, but, um, you know, is this child in essence struggling with socially as a result of any aspect of ADHD? So that's the starting point. I think there's a concept you can bring to helping kids with ADHD of just looking at everything through the lens of executive function. You know, where might this issue be happening because of some aspect of executive function? Sometimes I think that's a way of giving kids the benefit of the doubt. It's like life isn't always that simple. It isn't typically necessarily all executive function, but what if this issue was entirely executive function? So that's a good way to start problem solving. And then in looking at how you might support a child who's struggling socially, it really always comes down to um, those same four groups of interventions. You know, there isn't anything, I think it covers just about everything you might consider and you might go through the whole list, you know. If it's in the educational setting, are there school-based supports you might implement? If it's outside of school, is there something we can teach as parents? Is there a cognitive behavioral therapist who might get involved? Is there a social skills group you might wanna do? Um, you know, and then you can move on to the health piece and just look at how that is impacting overall resilience and well-being. And then clearly, you know, the medications might have a role too. And you can use that model for school problems, for social problems, you know, for anything and just sort of break it out into, well, what are the particular interventions then? When it comes to low self-esteem, I think, you know, which was the second half of the question, I think there's two, you know, broad answers, you know, for, for a talk like today, like two shorter concepts to put out that I think are helpful. Really the foundational one is that kids are experiential learners. So if they're struggling with low self-esteem, the most profound way to change that is to implement the supports that allow them to experience success. And over time, that will help them almost uniformly with self-esteem, which comes back again to that exact same model of do we have the right school supports in? Do we have the right behavioral supports in? Um, but there is a, for self-esteem in particular, there are a couple of things that can be more specifically helpful. One is what I mentioned earlier, which is being really structured about the sort of behavioral interventions we're doing as kids. It's really easy. The research even suggests it's very common to end up with mostly corrective interventions going on for kids with ADHD in classrooms or corrective interventions going on at home. And we really wanna make sure there's a foundation of positive supports 
sort of leading before the correction. The correction is really important too, but they need to experience praise and reward and positive time together. And that will accumulatively help with their self-esteem also. And then I think another thing that can help with self-esteem, particularly because many kids with ADHD are struggling with um, school in particular, it may also be helping them find and then valuing wherever they, you know, they, they do thrive in life more easily. And I think that's a really important aspect for many people with ADHD too. It's like, you don't, you know, if their soccer players value their soccer, if their artists value their art, you know, if their dancers value their dance, but find wherever it is that they have an outlet that they're more naturally and easily successful in. Um, and then I see, let's see, there's, a, there's several more questions. I wanna to try to get to them all, let me look at them. Um, I'll start with the shortest one, I'll work through them. So when somebody asked, first of all, and I did mean to touch on this, by both bio and neurofeedback for uh, ADHD. Uh, it's a great question. I did mean to touch on it. Um, so the theory behind bio and neurofeedback is quite strong. And I think that's an important starting point whenever you're talking about alternative care, because in the end, you know, if something just doesn't make sense theoretically, it could be their way ahead of the curve. It could just be that it doesn't make sense theoretically, and it's not gonna make sense in real life either. When it comes to bio and neurofeedback, the theory totally makes sense. It's trying to take advantage of um, a lot of the same things mindfulness tries to take uh, advantage of. Um, surprisingly to many people though, the research so far has not shown much generalization from neurofeedback into real life. So you see improvements within the, within the you know, actual specific skills you're learning in neurofeedback, there hasn't been much feedback and uh, generalization, excuse me, much success in generalizing that. Um, that's still being looked at. I think neurofeedback is something that you know, has a lot of potential and could help, but it doesn't have a lot of evidence with AD, for ADHD behind it quite yet. Um, the second question, so the last two, I'm gonna try to, they, they both could lead me down long answers, so I'll try to keep them shorter. So somebody asks, which is a common question about teaching mindfulness to the youngest kids. And, um, and I guess what I'll do is I'll try to summarize it by just talking about all age groups. Um, and the easiest way to think about it, I think, is starting from adults and working down. Um, so first of all, you can't tell anybody else to practice mindfulness as a whole. And mindfulness really represents a lot about how we're choosing to live life. So in any classroom or home, if you wanna introduce mindfulness to kids, the single most important thing initially is to just practice it yourself and trust that your experience of practicing mindfulness is something that's gonna spill over. The second reason that's really important is sometimes I like in teaching mindfulness to teaching tennis, where you, know, you don't have to be a tennis pro to teach your child the basics of practicing tennis, but you better know something about tennis. You, know, you have to make it fun and make sense for them. And the same thing goes for mindfulness. Like you, as you develop familiarity with it, you'll know how to teach it to your kids. So more specifically, as you work down from oldest to youngest, you can look at teenagers and recognize that for the most part, the practices can be similar to an adult practice. So it's really just, you know, whatever mindfulness practice you're, you're familiar with, you can just, you know, introduce it. But, you know, teens tend to want to be separating from their parents. So they might, be more likely to practice mindfulness if they hear it from some other adult outside the family they trust or if a friend's practicing it or if you find a mindfulness group for them. So mindfulness for teens um, doesn't have to be changed all that much, but you do have to make it real for them and connect with them wherever they are developmentally. And then as kids get younger, um, sort of middle elementary school, the practices often have to be simplified and you don't necessarily want to be talking about complex things about cognition that would be confusing, but the basics still may be the basics. So for a, you know, elementary school class, they sometimes do simple breathing practices or, or what we sometimes call a body scan. And, and you can introduce lots of different topics in that way, but you just want to, again, look at what's developmentally appropriate for that age group. And then in really young kids, which is what the question was, um, you have to look at where they are developmentally, which is that for a large part, um, they're learning from experience and play. So the practices often are very play-based, like put a stuffed animal on your belly and pretend you're rocking it to sleep. Or my friend, Amy Saltzman, who has a great book for kids out, uh, has a practice in her book where you, everyone's supposed to, I, I don't remember how she describes it exactly, but it's like you anchor your feet to the floor like you're on the seabed and then sway like you're a seaweed, you know, and for 
it's like for a preschool or the elementary school. Um, you can do little practices with sound and bells and, and all of them have to do with just really trying to make it, you know, you can't over explain it to a very young child. You just want to sort of, there's a, there's a core concept in mindfulness, which is called planting seeds, which is basically, you know, your very young kids aren't necessarily going to develop a very intense mindfulness practice, but you'd like them to become familiar with the ideas of, you know, being responsive and seeing with clarity and, um, I mean, there's so many things that can become almost part of a lifestyle. One of my, um, I mean, one teaching I just keep coming back to over and over again in the environment we're living in right now is this very foundational mindfulness teaching that says, you know, whatever you hear, just ask yourself, is it true? Um, now, that practice is first meant specifically around mindfulness. Like there's, you know, the basic premise is there's nothing I can tell you about mindfulness that has any value at all unless you go try it yourself and find it's true. You know, you have to make it useful for yourself or it's not worth, you know, the practice. The same thing, obviously, that same way of thinking is, is part of living with mindfulness is trying to just like not take everything on faith, question our assumptions and try to really seek out, you know, what's actually true. Um, so all of these things are just concepts we can try to teach if we have our own mindfulness practice. And then we just have to sort of make it engaging and realistic for the kids of whatever age they are. And that, that's how I would, a lot of information there. I do have a mindfulness uh, page on my website that just lists a lot of resources, including a lot of books for kids of different ages. So you can also just go to that if you wanna seek out specific programs. Um, and then let's see. I can't, uh, I'm sorry, but there's a really long question that's very specific about intervention for a child struggling with ADHD and anxiety um, and DBT versus CBT. So I can, I honestly, I can only answer the um, general parts of the question. And um, so let's see, I'll start with DBT versus CBT uh, because that's an easy one now that I've spoken about mindfulness. So DBT more or less integrates mindfulness into cognitive behavioral therapy. So it has, it's, a, it's a wonderful program. Many people really connect with it. It's using mindfulness to augment other aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and um, you know, I, I wouldn't set them off against each other. It's just trying to find a fit for you know, whatever individual situation you find yourself in. And in terms of treating anxiety versus ADHD, there's no, um, you know, that really has to be up. That's another question. So I guess I'll answer it differently um, because I can't answer spe you know, specifically without knowing more. But anxiety and ADHD frequently overlap. You know, that used to be almost contraindicated to start treating the ADHD first, but now research has really shown that in some people, if you start medication treatment for ADHD, their anxiety improves. You know, in other people, if they have enough of an anxiety disorder, you might want to consider treating the anxiety first. Um, and in many people, you do end up having to treat both. Um, you know, from a research point of view, there is probably more evidence that behavioral therapy can be effective alone for anxiety than there is for behavioral therapy alone being effective for ADHD. Um, so you just really have to, it's a judgment call based on in any moment in time, what's most disruptive. And I think that's a, you know, the only way to um, you know, answer it today, I think. Although you're welcome to ask a follow-up question if I, if I didn't do that well enough. Um, and I think there's time for a couple more questions and they're still coming. So um, there is a question about Uh, honestly, there's a question here that has to do with video activities and teens that I don't understand. So if you can reword that question, that would be useful. I, so I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't understand that question. So whoever posted the question about teens and video games, if you can repost it. I have another uh, statement. I guess it's not a question, but somebody is going to be. So there is a mindfulness-based program for ADHD. And um, so my friend Lydia Zalowska, uh, who is a, an adult psychiatrist, has put out one, of, she did one of the first studies, I think the first study on mindfulness and ADHD. And she has just recently released a um, programmatic take for clinicians on running her program. And um, Ellen Schwartz, who introduced me, is going to be leading an eight-week program based on that. So it's mindfulness for ADHD specifically. I should say, since um, 
it didn't come up specifically earlier that while it's totally true that mindfulness is something anyone can practice, like don't worry if you have ADHD, the fact that you might think you're too fidgety or too distractible to practice mindfulness is, you know, is not true because anybody can practice. The hard part of it is actually just the routine and that's addressed in the program, you know, and that's an important, you know, I think it's an important aspect of the program itself is that because if you can learn how to do it around your mindfulness practice, you can generalize that to other places as well. So if you um, contact the, the group, they can get you in touch with Alan if you're interested in that adult program. Uh, let's see, I am going to, I'll ask her one or two more questions then we probably have to wrap, wrap it up today. And a couple of other questions, let's see, two, two different questions about my books. Um, so I would say, um, if you're looking about, I, I guess it depends what you want. I, I mean, I appreciate people looking at my books. I'm a terrible salesman. So I always say, you know, get them from the library if you want. But I, I do, if people are asking about my books, I'll just very briefly say um, Mindful Parenting for ADHD lays out, you know, an executive function based approach to ADHD in parallel with and integrated with mindfulness for parents primarily. So if you, for whoever was asking about how to get started with a new approach for a seven year old with ADHD, that's definitively what that book's about. Um, How Children Thrive, which is my most recent one, looks at executive function as a path of development and looking at you know how understanding that can help us practically meet our kids where they are developmentally and make some choices um, you know that make things easier. So that's a uh, kind of a more general, that book's applicable to all parenting. Um, and then I have a book for teens that's coming out in a few months, but it's not out quite yet that integrates uh, mindfulness and self-compassion into understanding ADHD. So I appreciate people asking about that and um, and, and hope that's helpful. And then I have, let's see, one last question, or there's two different questions about screen time, I guess. Um, One is about, I guess they're related. Like basically the question is, is like during COVID, what are you gonna do about screen limits? And it's it's a really difficult question. I don't think there's a good answer. Uh, or a perfect answer, I guess. There's a good answer, but maybe an imperfect one. Um, I think I mentioned, maybe someone came on late, that the way I've been trying to help families navigate screen time during the pandemic is that there are, um, in essence, in my view, like three types of screen time we're all dealing with right now. You know, there's screen time related to school, and that might not be changeable much, and there's ways we can look at making that go better, you know, like shutting off YouTube during homework time or, you know, there are ways to manage that. But in the end, you know, school related screen time is just what it is for the moment. And then the second thing is social time. And that is, um, and then unfortunately, there's no clean answers that overlaps with gaming to some degree for many kids. But at the same time, clearly for kids to stay resilient, they have to be in touch with their friends. Much of that is online right now. So social time is social time. And you just have to look at you know, screen time, I always look at, it's like creating a balanced food plate. I mean, you can't, you know, you just, there's no right answer for every household. Everyone eats a little differently, but we all know what a balanced food plate looks like in general. So the second thing is social time. I'm not saying limit screen time to the point that our kids can't see their friends. It's just another piece of the overall day. And then when you look at the rest of the day, whatever's left at that point, you know, there's where you really need to look at what leads to mental health. And that's where kids might need actual limits still, even during COVID of, you know, that's enough. You need to get outside or that's enough. You need to exercise or get to bed or, you know, kids rely on us for that. So that third piece of things, which is just kind of open-ended, you know, YouTube games shows, you know, that probably still, there is still room for limits because kids need our guidance to, um, to fill that time. And, um, and if someone's become hooked on a lifestyle, lifestyle where they have no idea how to do that. You know, it's just about choosing our battles because, you know, I'm not sure in the crisis that is COVID, we want to create another war right now. Um, And yet at the same time, um, kids won't learn to entertain themselves and won't learn to fill their time with more healthy ways unless we, uh, you know, more directly guide them or set limits sometimes. So, you know, even a teen with ADHD might need, um, or especially a teen with ADHD, especially, but even a teenager might need just a screen bedtime in their house where like everything is shut down at a certain time during the school week. 
or they might need just some boundary on the weekends of like, you know, beyond this, you can't, you know, beyond this point, none shall pass. And you're just going to have to stop now and do some other activity. And at the same time, I wouldn't encourage anyone to do that if it's going to cause some sort of, you know, like in this moment in time where everyone's just hanging on by a thread, you know, don't create some sort of explosive new situation by imposing some sort of new limit out of the blue. Um, you know, but just recognize, you know, what you'd like to see happen and recognize what's possible and try to steer things that directly, you know, that direction as best as you're able. So um, I think we've gotten through everything. So thank you all for being here. I really, you know, wish everyone well. I hope, you know, everyone can stay healthy. You know, I'm sure many people who have been on today are living in pretty challenging times because we all are and also because ADHD um, is a particular stress living at home right now. So I hope that information was helpful and um, you can all find me through my website if you need. So thank you all so much. Mark, thank you so much for such a thorough, uh, stimulating and overwhelming <laughs> <laughs> amount of information. Uh, as you said, I think we could have a meeting on each one of these topics. Um, and um, perhaps you'll be willing to come back and... <laughs> I'm sure. No, I, I'd be happy to come back. It's absolutely anytime. Um, we appreciate that. Um, so uh, as you know, Mark, when we are in a silent retreat, we go like this as a way of applauding. <laughs> so um, if people want to give Mark some feedback uh, about how much they enjoyed it. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for joining. Um, please check out our website. Um, join Chad if you're not a Chad member already. Uh, if you want to write to me about the mindfulness um, course, it's adhd.bergencounty at gmail.com. You can find that on our website. And um, I think it's on our Facebook Facebook page now as well. Mark, nice to see you. Thank Good you. Seeing you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. All right. Good night.